food fight. <laughs> now, when I was growing up, those two words were a declaration of war. There were many small food fights in Centennial Junior High and some in the halls and out on the back patio and all that. But you know what? I remember the biggest war very well. The lunch lady made the foolish decision to leave her post momentarily and figured that we were mature enough not to have any problems. But somebody yelled, and it wasn't me, somebody yelled, food fight, and proceeded to lob a mashed potato grenade onto the next table. And soon the food was flying. And it looked like a scene out of uh, one of those movies that maybe you've seen. But I really, uh, to understand the stories, you, you need to know something, which is in junior high, I had a privileged position. It was a position of honor and prestige. I was sort of a local celebrity, actually, if you want to know the truth. You see, I was the lunchroom DJ. I was spinning discs, you know, LPs. That's back when there were albums and stuff like that. Behind a little booth, just not too much bigger than this, DJ Scott. Now, some of you are maybe having a little bit of trouble picturing that, you know, and you're thinking, hey, bay, bay. You know, it's so hot up in the club <laughs> that Scott ain't got his shoes on or something like that. No, th th remember, this is the 80s, okay? I, I just celebrated my 41st birthday. You know, this, this was the 80s. We're talking REO Speedwagon here and Pink Floyd and Kiss and things like that, you know? And so on this fateful day here, maybe even a Bee Gees or two by request, not by my choice, but, you know, and that beautiful day there, that fateful day, when that full-on food fight went on. Well, you know what? I looked into my little lunch bag there, and I found a handful of my mom's homemade trail mix, and I let it fly. Just, you know, gave it my best throw right there. And at that very moment, the lunch lady came back into the room and, in fact, walked right in front of me. It was too late by the time I saw her to stop what I was doing. And so she took a full direct hit at close range. I pelted her with a handful of peanuts and raisins and M&Ms and some little sunflower seeds and other things that my mom would put in there. Now, I ducked down kind of like this behind the DJ booth, you know, <laughs> hoping that maybe she didn't know exactly where it came from. But this is what I saw was the lunch lady doing this over the booth. <laughs> and there I was crouched on the ground with a little half uh, bag of trail mix. So it was pretty obvious the uh, guilt at hand there. And so I lost my privileged position that day. I was no longer DJ Scott. And so I tell you this sad little story here as an introduction to 1 Corinthians 8 for one reason really, which is that the church was in the middle of a food fight there in Corinth. A food fight, you might ask, well, yes, but you see they weren't launching peas from a spoon, if any of you have ever done that, or tossing trail mix and that sort of thing. No, in fact, they were doing something a lot messier than that, a lot more harmful than that. They were throwing around their pride and their knowledge and their personal rights and their personal perspectives. They were being very selfish in those things. And the Apostle Paul was kind of like that lunch lady, if you don't mind me using that analogy, coming back in to restore some order. And so we've seen in every chapter so far in Corinth, well, it was completely a pagan place. And the church was trying to figure out how to get away from that influence and actually have an influence on that pagan place. And so there was a lot of false religion, of course. There were false gods, kind of an anything goes mentality. And the sinful culture of Corinth had actually gone as far as to influence even the food. Now, you might ask, how could that be? Well, much of the meat in the market, see, it came from animals that had been sacrificed to false gods. And so the church was kind of fighting, having this food fight over whether it was okay to eat that magical mystery meal there. You know, can we or can't we? Should we or shouldn't we? And so before we get too far into tonight's teaching and the verses there, I want to uh, recognize and realize with you that, you know what, this is probably not a specific issue that you struggle with per se. You know, it doesn't keep you up at night as a Christian. You know, I'd, as far as I know, nobody's gone over to the Calvary Cafe over there and asked uh, some of the folks there, hey, you know, does this chicken in the quesadilla, does it have a pagan past or is it, you know, everything cool? No, we only use the best Christian chickens around here. But, you know, <laughs> you'll see in this section of Scripture here that it's actually extremely important to our lives and very relevant. Why? 
because it contains some timeless principles right there in the midst of all this that go far beyond food for us. See, issues of faith and freedom, the very central issues of what it is to be a Christian, grace and humility and love and sin and selfishness and, yes, selflessness. And so I want to do a little something different tonight than usual. Uh, we ordinarily cover maybe a chapter or maybe two right in a row from a uh, section of Scripture. But when Paul wrote this, remember, this was just kind of one long letter. It wasn't broken up into chapters. He didn't write it chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, or any of that. It's just really our way of finding our way around God's Word. And so tonight we're actually going to look at chapter 8, but then we're going to jump over to the last part of chapter 10 because it really brings the closer to this uh, situation here because he deals with the same subject in that later chapter. So we'll just talk about those things together just for clarity and understanding. So you guys ready to get into the midst of the food fight here in Corinth? You know, just maybe duck down a little behind your seat if you see something flying. But verse 1, what you'll see, it says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up and love edifies. Now, the Spanish service was last night, but I know a little bit of Spanish, and I know that edificio means building. It means to build something. And so edify, well, it's the same root word there in understanding. It means to build something up. And so the Corinth church was in the middle of kind of a teardown, not a buildup, and they were in a food fight, but it didn't start with their stomach. See, that wasn't really the issue. The problem was really with their head and with their heart. That's what we're going to see is always really at the heart of the issue. And so the knowledge that they had, well, they had some stuff in their head, and of course, they maybe had some things in their heart, but we do need both of those things in some form of balance, a biblical understanding of those things. It's all right to have a head full of facts, but you know what? We need to not only know God's truths, we need to experience and express and share God's love. We need both of those things, a head full of truth, a heart full of God's love. And so that brings us to principle number one that we'll pull out of this section of Scripture, which is that Christianity isn't just about the head, it's actually about our heart. And so Paul right there says, verse 1, knowledge puffs up. You know, it can be a problem if you get a head full of facts and that's all you get. No, in fact, he says, you know what, love builds up. Love is something that goes beyond just facts in your head, but the love and grace and mercy of God lived out through your life. That's what he's talking about here. And so, yeah, we need some knowledge, of course, along the way. And so here's some facts for your head just so you understand the context that Paul is addressing. Underlying this food fight here in Corinth, again, it was the issue of idolatry. And that's a very serious issue, of course. And so the pagan people would sacrifice animals to false gods. And the meat would end up at the market, often at a discounted price. Okay, special sale, you know, satanic meat or whatever else. And you say, oh, good, okay. Well, the fact is here that the Corinth temples were kind of like modern malls, if you've been to those, you know, complete with food courts. And so a temple, typical temple pagan practice here might be, okay, well, I go in in the early service, I sacrifice to a false god, have a little sex with the uh, temple prostitute there, and then, hey, what's for lunch? You know, let's go on out to the market. That was what they were all about. If you've been here with the studies, you know what I'm talking about. And so on the menu, you might find, hey, heathen hamburger. Should I have that? Or maybe the pagan pot roast. Or maybe the deviled ham. Yeah, that's what I'll have. They make a really good one of those. No, you see, it's not always quite that obvious, is it? No, see, in fact, the people there in Corinth were having that very problem. It was kind of a mystery meat. You know, it's like, I don't know where it came from. I don't even really know what it is. I just know it's cheap, and I know I don't have a lot of money, so I'd really like to buy this and eat it if I can. And so the Corinth church was kind of, they're a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, okay? And if, if you don't know what the word Gentile means, it just means a non-Jew. So it's Jews or everybody else. And so there's the Jews, the Gentiles, and when they come to Christ, no longer those distinctions really that important. What it really says is the church, the church made up of Jews and Gentiles who have come to Christ. And so the Jewish religion, if you know anything about it, well, certainly it has a lot of dietary, dietary restrictions. And so for, for many of these Jewish Christians coming from that background, well, it was kind of a kosher crisis every time that they would sit down to a meal. You know, their kosher conscience would scream out, no, don't eat that meat. You know, don't do that. There could be something bad in there. And, you know, God will judge and all the rest of that. And they had to leave that all behind as they came to Christ. And so also that habit would die hard as it does in many of us. And so as the 
Corinthian Gentiles there, on the other hand, they came to faith from a totally different understanding, a totally different background, an all different knowledge of the way the world was. And so some felt very free to eat any food from any source and give glory to God to it. And it was just kind of like, hey, God, thanks for this filet mignon or whatever it is. I thank you that I got it at a bargain price and no problem. But then there were other Corinthian Christians who were struggling still. And what was their issue? Well, they were having kind of some fleshly flashbacks, if you will. I don't know if you've ever had those, but you come to Christ and you have new life in Christ. And then it's kind of like old life goes, bing, here I am, you know, that kind of thing. And so they're having these flashbacks to their former ways of idolatry, of sin, of indulgence. And they begin to feel very guilty. They begin to say, man, I can't eat this. This is a Zeus burger. I can't do this. It's a demon dog. No way. God will be mad at me if I eat this meat here. And so that's the context. That's the understanding for our heads. But let's move on past that and ask, how does this section apply to us today? How is it going to hit our hearts? Well, I I appeal again and repeat to principle number one, which is Christianity is not just about the head. It has to hit the heart. It has to be about more than just facts. And see, God wants us to know the truth that sets us free. Absolutely, he does. But you know what? He wants us to then live that truth in love, in a way that sets other people free and actually draws other people to Christ, not repels them from him. And so, you know, the Christians there in Corinth, they considered themselves spiritually superior. Some of them did because of what they either did or did not eat. And so they were looking down on those who were eating the demon dogs. And maybe those who were struggling with some of these issues and saying, well, should I or shouldn't I and all that? And they're kind of going, look, isn't it obvious that an idol's nothing? I mean, you should be able to eat it. Or they were saying, you know what? You're an idolater. You shouldn't eat it, all that kind of stuff. And so there were both sides of the struggle and both sides of that food fight. And some were flaunting their freedom And it was causing a big problem there because they were lacking love. See, that's the thing. They had maybe a lot of knowledge up here, but they were lacking the love that really reflected the heart of God. And so others were living in unnecessary fear, in condemnation and guilt because they thought what they were doing was wrong and displeasing to God when really it wasn't. You know, maybe I accidentally ate a pagan pork chop and I'm going to go to hell now, you know. I don't want to do, I didn't mean to, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, hey, Let me address the issue. So it wasn't really the food that caused the fight in Corinth. It was a lack of knowledge in some and a lack of love in many others. And that's a much more correctable and common problem. So there was a lack of love when it came to dealing with debatable issues. And this is often where divisions happen in churches. Not everything's spelled out specifically in Scripture. You may have noticed that as you read through. And some people like to live everything by chapter and verse. And hey, if it's in there, I'll do it. If it's not in there, I'll do whatever I want to do and that kind of thing. And You know what? This is the thing. Some things are always wrong, and they're spelled out very clearly that way. You know, we already talked about some of them in this book. Fornication, sin, you know, always. Uh, Lying, always a sin. Idolatry, always a sin. He's talked about this stuff. But see, the the Corinthians had written a letter to Paul saying, hey, we've got a few questions about some of the not-so-clear stuff, you know, things that are kind of somewhere in between those things a shade of gray. And so they're saying, hey, what about eating meat sacrificed to idols? I'm not talking about idolatry per se. We already know that's wrong to actually be there in the temples doing the idolatry yourself. But here's the question. I don't do the idolatry. I didn't fornicate with the prostitute there at the place or any of that. I just bought the burger afterwards. I mean, that's really all I did. Is that okay or is it not okay? And so Paul's going to address this. And you know what? There are many gray areas there will always be when it comes to the Christian life. And so sometimes people get very mixed up in these areas. And in fact, people begin to have the equivalent of a food fight. The same thing that was happening here in Corinth, maybe over a totally different issue, but it's a minor matter all the same. And it's a correctable issue and it's an understandable issue. You know, maybe uh, over the course of the Christian history, there's been questions like these. You know, can Christians dance? Is it proper for Christians to dance? Can Christians dance? Some of you have already heard the good answer to this one, which is some can and some cannot, you know? Uh, now, I fall into the cannot, you know? That's why I did the DJ thing. I'll let other people dance. I'll just spin the discs. But here's the thing. You know, a lot of different issues like that. Drinking, you know, can I, can't I, how much is too much, all of that sort of thing. Smoking, tobacco products, apparel, movies, TV. And even as I say those, some people immediately get defensive 
or offensive on it. Well, wait a minute. Exactly. See, that's what he's saying. We can get into these things, but remember, we're not governed by rules and regulations as Christians. We are not to be the kind of people who start getting into all these gray matters and making a big mess of all of them. No, we're to be principled people. We're to be people who live by our conviction and by that strength of conviction that this is what God has called me to do and here is why. And that's why we're covering some of these principles here tonight. The law of love. See, in many ways, it's a much more, it's a higher law, not a lower law. It's a different law, the law of love. And so Paul points out that the food fight here would not be won in the minds of people, but in their hearts. That if you really want to win a war like that, you're not going to win it in a person's mind. You're going to win it by winning their heart. And so the solution isn't logic, it's love. That's really the issue here. And the Corinthians weren't necessarily lacking in knowledge. In fact, sometimes they had a little bit too much for their own good. But they were lacking in love. So you can never have too much love. Sometimes you can have a little bit too much knowledge. And so verse 1, knowledge puffs up, Paul said. But love builds up. Love does something for others. And knowledge was, hey, meat doesn't matter to God. Well, that's true. The Bible makes that very clear. It doesn't matter where the meat came from ultimately. But you know what? They knew that truth. They knew God's truth, but they didn't have God's love. So what happened? They became puffed up. They became proud. They said, look, I can eat what I want, when I want, and nobody can tell me any different. Jesus said so, so na 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 and that kind of stuff. Now, unfortunately, some of the meanest people you will ever meet in life, I don't know if you've experienced this, but some of the meanest people that you will ever meet in life will claim to be Christians. They'll have a head full of Bible knowledge, but they will have a heart empty of the love of God, and that's a dangerous combination. They begin to use the truth of God as a weapon rather than as a healing agent, as it was meant to be. And so Jesus, well, he used it sometimes to cut, yes, but always to heal. Always to heal, like a surgeon's scalpel, not like a sword to cut somebody's head off. Now, unfortunately, what you see is that we can become, as Christians, very much like they were here, a Christian cactus, as I like to call it. What is that? Well, you have many fine points, but nobody can get close to you. Nobody can embrace the truths that you're holding. Oh, it's a very fine point. It's very sharp, and boy, are you smart. But nobody wants to get close to it. All the right answers, but none of the right attitude. And so the point of Bible study, remember this always, we're here at a Bible study. It's not just loving to learn. It's learning to love. And those are two very different things. See, a lot of people love to learn. The perpetual student, you know, the person who's still in school, you know, 42 years on and all that sort of thing. But, you know, every time we learn something new here or in any place as we come to God's word about God or about God's word, this is what we should do. We should pray and we should ask God to turn what we learn into love. Lord, run it through and turn what I've learned into love. And every Bible fact should somehow lead, eventually even, to a loving act. If I have a Bible fact here, it ought to lead to a loving act. And so, verse 2, we'll get to that one. It says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one's known by him. Now, this brings us to principle number two that we study tonight. And that is that Christianity is really about who you love, not what you know. It's about who you love, not what you know. And the two who's that we're supposed to love are God first and then others. That's how Jesus summarized the Bible. He said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Bible in four words. Love God, love others. And so Christianity is about who you love, not what you know. And the worldly way is to maybe learn much and let that knowledge puff you up in pride. Again, you, people can be very proud of how smart they are. I'm so smart, you're so dumb, I know so much. Oh, that Christianity stuff, I guess... That's for the people who don't really know things. See, I'm a lot more intellectual than that and that sort of thing. But you know what? Christians can be very puffed up in their pride as well. And so the fact of our faith is that the more you know God, I'm not just talking about knowing about God, but the more you know God, the more humble you get. It's something that happens in your heart as you begin to see how big and how good and how awesome he is and how not all those things I am. And so... You know what, the more humility you see in a person's life, that's when you're seeing that person's starting to know God. That person is coming into contact with Christ. And so again, you can tell if someone really knows God because of the humility and love in their life. And a person can know a whole lot about religious things, you know, and about spiritual things and about all those things that maybe are very self-righteous, but they can be unloving. 
And it's impossible to be self-righteous if you come into contact with Christ. If you've seen the cross and what your sin did to him on the cross, it's a little hard to be puffed up in pride. It's a little be, bit hard to be condemning of others when you see what all the Lord has done on your behalf. And so, you know, I've been a believer since 1993. And at first, if I, if I can be this transparent about it, you know, I really began to actively pursue knowledge. I was like, I'm going to know all that there is to know. And if there's going to be somebody who's going to have a question, I'm going to be able to answer it, and I'm going to become the Bible Answer Man Part 2 or something, you know. And there came a time, a little, I don't know, I guess a month into it, you know, or something that I was like, hey, I'm getting this Bible thing down pretty well, you know. Starting to know some verses, even taught a few truths, and people said, oh, I didn't know that, you know. Beginning to think, hey, I've got God really figured out, you know. I, hey, I know his next move, you know. I know what he's going to do next. And so began to get very puffed up in that. And you know what? God is very faithful. One of the things he's faithful to do is pop our bubble. He's very good at taking out the pin to that sin and going, you know, let's see how smart you are. And, you know, it's kind of ironic to me in a way that the longer I know the Lord, the more I realize how little I know, first, about, first of all, about his word, and second of all, about him and how much there is to know yet about his word and about him. And specifically, you know, it's not that God is just uh, changing my head, but changing my heart. And he's using in some ways some very painful processes to do that. I mean, one of them was the uh, recent death of a very close friend. And just in those things, you know, it's like God was saying to me in so many ways, you know, what, Scott, you love to teach, but I want to teach you to love. Oh, you love to learn, but you need to learn to love. And that's going to be a little more challenging thing. It's not just your head, it's your heart. And so we've seen an unprecedented growth, I think, in our lifetime in knowledge, in facts. You know, it's some people who study these things, they took the time to kind of quantify what mankind has learned since the beginning of time, whenever that was, and they don't exactly know. But, you know, they say, okay, up until 1965, there was a certain body of knowledge. And that body of knowledge doubled by 1975. So however long it took to get to 1965, we learned a bunch of stuff. But in the next 10 years, we learned twice as much stuff. And they now say that it's moving so quickly that every five years, knowledge is doubling. That five years from now, there'll be twice as much to know as there is to know now. But here's the thing. Is love doubling every five years? I mean, as a society, is it doubling? Knowledge is running wild. Is love doubling? Is it doubling in our own lives? That's a good question. Five years from now, will I love more than I do today? Well, I might know more. I might know less. But I hope I love a whole lot more and learn to do that. And it's common to find people in churches who have a love of learning. But it's less common to find a person who really has that passion to learn to love. Because, again, knowledge puffs up. It's something, oh, wow, that person knows so much. But a much better compliment is that person loves so much. And beware lest your head grow and your heart shrink. It can happen. And Jesus said the greatest is the servant of all, not the know-it-all. Now, again, I'm not knocking knowledge. We need it. But with that context, Paul goes on to give a very straight answer on this subject. He says in verse 4, Therefore, Concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, or as, and as there are many gods and many lords, and notice those are small letters in your Bible suggesting and, and showing that those are not real gods or lords, but we call them such, and yet, for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom, there are all, of whom are all things, and we for him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Now, this is a great starting point. Fear not, I'm not going to throw this. I know tonight's teaching is about food fight or you know, throwing drinks or what. I, I just need a drink. Made you nervous, though. If I'd taken out mashed potatoes, you would have known different. Okay, so his starting point here is knowledge, right? A truth that sets us free. The only truth that really sets people free, which is there's one God and one Lord, Jesus Christ. 
And so we as Christians, when we know this, we also know something else, that anything else is idolatry. Everything else is a false god or a false lord. And so we know right away, hey, an idol is nothing. When we come to see that God is everything, we know an idol is nothing. Only a whittled piece of wood at best, a sculptured stone maybe, a piece of plastic, a hunk of silver or gold. Now, again, some people, depending on your background, that might come as a shocking statement that they'd say, these things seem to have so much power over people and things. And you go, yeah, but the idol, it's just junk. It's just nothing. God made man and man made gods, but all of those gods are just false gods. And that foundational fact ought to be pretty obvious to anyone who knows Christ for any length of time and knows his word. And so verse 7 goes on to say, a however, something that we need to temper that knowledge with, which it says not, not everyone has that knowledge. There's not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now I remind you that Corinth was a pretty new church when this was being uh, written to them. You know, they hadn't been around a long time, and there were a lot of new, very fresh believers there, fresh out of idolatry, maybe didn't even know the Word of God at all, but knew the God of the Word. They had been introduced to Christ, they came to faith in Him, and they're saved, and they had a lot of growing to do, but they didn't have a lot of knowing so far. And so they bite into a burger, and again, they have that fleshly flashback, and they're thinking, man, if I eat this meat, God's going to be mad at me. God's going to get me. I mean, this was sacrificed to an idol. I know what all that idolatry is about. I've been there. I've seen it. I don't want anything to do with it. And they would begin to maybe have their mind run wild, and they'd say, you know, I'm, maybe I'm under the curse. It's a demon-possessed patty. Ah, you know, and all this. I can't sleep at night thinking about it. Now, to them, again, Paul's admitting, hey, that idol is something. You know what that idol is? It's something that used to have a hold on them and doesn't need to have a hold on them anymore, but maybe it still does. You know, maybe in some ways it still does. Why? Because they still don't know the truth that really sets them free. That greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And that idol itself has nothing, but behind that, of course, idolatry has all kinds of power in it. But the idol itself, nothing. And so, Maybe that's where you find yourself tonight, kind of like the Corinthian church. Maybe a newer believer, maybe somebody who doesn't have all the Word of God memorized yet, you know. Maybe not real confident in your faith in Jesus, not knowing with absolute certainty, you know, that my life's pleasing to God because of Jesus, not because of what I ate last week or didn't eat last week, what day I ate it on, or, you know, whether or not it came from the right source or whether or not all of the different... Uh, regulations were followed with it or any of that sort of thing. You know, people have, depending on their background, a lot more sensitivity to that kind of stuff. And so lots of religious hang-ups, maybe, traditions, legalistic approach to God, a misunderstanding of God that someone somewhere along the, the way uh, convinced you that, oh yeah, there is a God, but you know what, he's mainly out to get you. And uh, he's looking for any minor infractions. And uh, if he gets you, boy, he's going to get you, and he'll nail you for even the little petty stuff if he can. Well, that's not the approach that God wants us to have to him. And so Paul makes the facts on food just so clear that we can't miss it. It says it doesn't matter to God what we eat or when we eat it. Verse 8, but food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor... If we do not eat, are we the worst? Now, obviously, he's talking in a spiritual sense. If you go without food forever, you'll die. So he's not talking about that or even saying that there's certain food that makes sense to eat and others that do not. You know, if you exist on a, a diet of Oreos, well, you're going to find yourself going to meet the Lord a lot quicker. And so, you know, he's not saying that there's no benefits to health uh, choices or anything else. He's saying there's no spiritual significance to what we eat or we do not eat. And there are those even today who will try to turn food issues into faith issues and, you know, start a food fight, really. And when I was in uh, the Bible college and doing some different instruction in that area, and there was a, a very respected and, and well-known commentator who wrote one of the books for the textbooks for the class that I was doing. And, and one of the students came up to me and asked me a question in it and said, hey, 
Uh, it says right here that if you do not eat meat, you leave yourself up to demon possession, open to demon possession. Uh, I looked at it and I'm like, well, I didn't see that in the commentary, but there it was. You know, again, a great commentary, well respected, but this crazy sentence right in the middle of it with no Bible reference or anything else, just, hey, if you don't eat meat, if you choose to be a vegetarian, you leave yourself open to demon possession. Now, she came to me and said, is that biblical? She happened to be a vegetarian. And I said, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, it's true, and that's why we're really glad that Burger King's right up the street because we do double Whopper uh, exorcisms here, and those flame broiled burgers, let me tell you, they will kill anything and everything. And so, uh, you know, if you'd like to be exercised of that, we can go right up the street and share a uh, big king meal or whatever. You know. No, I was joking with her, but I said, listen, the Bible makes it very clear. That's why that guy didn't give a Bible reference because it isn't in the Bible. We're saved by faith, not by food. It's very obvious with that. But verse 9, he says, beware, beware. Beware what? Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours, this knowledge of yours, this understanding of the truth become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who's weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? Now, what's he saying here? This is getting into some very important principles for us to apply to our lives. He's saying, you know what? Knowledge is not the end all and be all of any issue. You know, you can know that an idol's nothing. Okay, that's great. But if you come to the conclusion that there's nothing wrong with you participating in that pagan practice in some way, at least appearing to in some way, swinging by the temple for a meal, well, he said, remember, knowledge puffs up but love builds up. It's not just about the head. It's not just about the knowledge. It's about your heart. It's not about what you know. It's about who you love. And so that's principle number three being led to, which is the mark of maturity in our life is when we become concerned for the weak, when we have a care for the weak. See, a lot of times people think that maturity is becoming strong in my faith. Well, it is in some ways, but it's also having the concern for the person who maybe hasn't made it all the way down that road of faith yet. Somebody who is still in a weak condition. Somebody who maybe is new and very sensitive to these things and would look on and say, well, man, isn't that Pastor Pedro at the pagan temple? What's he doing there? Well, I guess if he's there, I should go there. And all of a sudden, they're sucked right back into their old life. And you say, wait a minute. You didn't care one bit. But my knowledge was an idol is nothing. That doesn't have anything to do with the decision. See, love asks a much better question than, can I do this? Can I do this? I hear that sometimes. Can I do this and be a Christian? Can I do that and be a Christian? The real question is this. What effect will my freedom have on another person? Not just loving to learn. Again, learning to love. Not self-centered, others-oriented. Somebody who would look on and say, would this cause somebody to stumble? Because if it would, I'm not going to do it. And you think of the example, again, what we have with freedom. Well, let's say you have a diabetic friend, okay? You yourself are not diabetic, but you have a diabetic friend. And so you go over to their house and you bring them a thing of sugar cookies. And then you go, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot. You're, you're diabetic. Here, let me eat these. Wah, 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 you know, whoo, boy, this would go good with some ice cream, wouldn't it? Mm, all that kind of stuff. And you say, wait a minute, am I free to do that? Yes. Am I a friend if I do that? No. And so you see that truth sets us free, but love limits liberty voluntarily. See, it's the wrong question to be asking, can I do this and still be a Christian? That's not even the right question to ask. You can't answer a, a question that shouldn't be asked. What's the right question to ask? What effect will this have on others? Is this the loving thing to do? Is this the loving thing to do? especially the weak, how would they be affected by this? Because a mark of maturity is a concern for the weak. And you see in verse 11, he says, because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin, hmm, that's the first time this word has appeared in this section on gray areas. All of a sudden, it's gotten not into a gray area, but a very straightforward area. He says, when you sin this way against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now, does that mean we all have to become vegetarians in here? Is that what he's talking about? No, it's not what he's talking about. Again, he was saying in this context, 
eating the meat, what kind of meat? The meat that was sacrificed to idols. He said, yeah, knowledge-wise, I can know an idol's nothing. The meat didn't change somehow. I can have it, and it's no problem. But he said, if it causes a problem in a person, I'll forego it, and I'll do something else. I'll do something different. And so what you see here, principle number four, which is that something that is morally neutral can become actually a sin when we cause somebody else to stumble. See, every one of us in our lives will either be a stepping stone or a stumbling stone to people. We'll either be somebody that people can stand on as they do their walk of faith and we, they would actually be something that you'd help them to that point of maturity, maybe where they'd even have no longer false guilt over things that God really doesn't care about or wouldn't have these hang-ups that really are non-biblical. Maybe you could help them get that way by being a humble stepping stone. But if you become a proud stumbling stone, you'll never get that privilege to be that in a person's life. And so he says, you know, that's actually crossing over into the area of sin when you do that. The sin wasn't eating the meat. That wasn't the issue. God doesn't care about that. The sin was selfishness. It was acting with knowledge that didn't have love at the base, to, base of it. And so you see also in verse 12 that when we sin against others, when we sin against the church, when we sin against our believing brothers and sisters, he says, you know, you're really sinning against Christ. That takes it into a whole other realm. They say, oh, man, I, I don't mind offending you, but uh, I'm not sure I want to offend Jesus. Well, I can't offend you without offending him ultimately. And so if you think about that by analogy, uh, you know, we have three kids, and if you hurt my kids, you hurt me, and in many ways you can hurt me more by hurting my kids than you can directly by hurting me. Because I look on at that and say, wait a minute, that's, that's somebody, pick on somebody your own size, you know, that sort of thing. Although my son's just about to be past me, but hey, you get the point. So if we know these things, if we live in love, this is what he's getting at, we'll not only be free, but we'll lead others to be free too. And that is a great and privileged position. We'll provide an environment of grace in our life, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our relationships, where people can grow. Where people can grow not only in the knowledge of God's word, but grow with the heart of God's love. And grow in knowledge and in love. And both of those are important. And so, yeah, again, an idol is nothing. That's true. But there's another truth that needs to go with that one, which is that knowledge is nothing without love. And so the last part of chapter 10 there, it continues uh, the subject that Paul started. So I said we're going to look not only at chapter 8, but we have a few minutes to spend in chapter 10. And so we're just going to pop over there, and uh, Pastor Pedro will look at chapter 9, and then I'll come look at the first part of chapter 10 later. But we'll cover just the last verses, because again, it gets in the midst of this food fight, and it really brings it to a very fitting close in chapter 10. So let's go finish off the fight there in verse 23 of chapter 10. And this is what it says. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. And that really ties again back to that first verse of chapter 8. Remember it said, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Love edifies. And that's what he's saying here again. He's saying, you know, not all things build up, not all things edify. But he says in verse 24, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now here in the last verses of 1 Corinthians 10, you're going to see principle number five. And we'll look at three principles right from this little section of scripture. Principle number five, Faith frees, but love limits. If you just want to write that down in your notes or you march under your Bible or think it through with me here tonight, faith frees, but love limits. And so that's the biblical balance. What is the freedom that faith brings? Well, again, I can look at you and say, you know what, I am free. I've never been so free. As a matter of fact, a person who thinks that they are free and they haven't come to Christ doesn't know what true freedom is. They're just under the wrong master. But you see, I'm free. And, and all things, like Paul said here, all things are lawful for me. Now, the other day I got pulled over by a police officer. I didn't use this verse right here. Hey, all things are lawful for me. You know, I know that you said I didn't need legal lane change, but, uh, but uh, all things are lawful. No, that would not be a good idea. But he says there, I'm not under a list of rules. I'm not trying to earn God's favor by doing all the right stuff and having this list. And if I do this and I don't do this, God will accept me and all that stuff. He said, you know what? Christ does away with that 
understanding and that mentality. It's not a eat this, don't eat that, do this, don't do that. No, it's a life lived for love for Christ and the love of Christ compels. And you see that faith in him freeing a person to live life as it was meant to be lived. Not under this real guilt for all the control of sin and not under false guilt for the things that you think God is mad about that he's really not because you come to understand what he's really about. And so my faith in Jesus, well, it puts me in a right relationship with God. And that's what Paul was able to say. I'm forgiven. My past is my past. My future is secure. My sin isn't counted against me. I don't live in guilt and condemnation. I don't live in fear. I know that God loves me, and I know that there's nothing I can do to make him stop doing that, and I'm going to heaven when I die, and all of those things that come with the commitment to Christ. I'm free. That's the freedom of faith. But there's also a limit to love. Again, I say it's the law of love. It's coming to Christ in love. And what is that? Well, verse 24, he says, you've got to learn to look out for others. See, God's love sets me free, but free to do what? Free to live a life of love, which is what life was meant to be about. It limits my liberty in some ways. Love does. You know what? When I said I do to my wife, you know what I was also saying? I don't to some other things, right? Because love makes a voluntary vow to limit itself in some ways. And I'm in love with the Lord. And Paul was able to say the same. And he said, you know what? That brings ultimate freedom to my life. And yeah, a few limits too. Because I love him, I don't want to grieve him. I don't want to do anything that would hurt him. It's not that I'm afraid that God will hurt me. You know, if I do this, he'll strike me with lightning or something. No. It's a whole different understanding. It's when you say, man, I don't want to do this and hurt him. Why would I do this in a way that would grieve God? And because I love him, you know what? I want other people to. Because I know to know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. And so I do. And I do. And I want others. That was one of the DJ things, you know, from that. That's kind of an oldie goldie. But I want others to come to Christ. And so I'm not really thinking, well, hey, I've come to Christ and I don't care what happens to you or what you think of him or think of me. No, I'm conscious of those things. And love will seek out the good of others and not demand its own rights. And so faith frees, but love limits. And so practically, Paul puts it this way in verse 25. Eat whatever's sold in the market, in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and all its fullness. Now that's the first part to Paul's answer here he says you're free you're free remember faith frees eat the meat you know (laughs) don't worry about it it came from a cow that God made you know the Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and that's one of them you know and just because some pagan took it and sacrificed it to some idol doesn't change the fact that that meat is going to nourish you and don't you worry about it it was God's before the sacrifice it'll be God's afterwards and just say a nice prayer and don't worry about mad cow disease. Now, you see in verse 25, he does say something that I think we can learn a lot from. Again, faith frees, and I know so many people who live this eggshell life just so scared that they're going to do something wrong. He says, asking no questions. You know what he's saying there? Well, he's, he's freeing us not to be sin sniffers, you know, not to have to look under every rock for a reason to be offended in life. You know, I don't do that. You don't need to do that. It's, it's easy enough to get offended without having to look for offensive things. And so we live in a very wicked world. And sometimes people have this thing that, you know, if there's any pagan problem anywhere in it, did you know that that toothpaste was owned by a pagan company? Who cares? I'm going to brush my teeth. I need to brush my teeth. You know, that's at the end of the day, why are you asking all these questions and trying to unearth all these conspiracies? If you want to find a moral dilemma, you don't have to look very far. You don't have to turn things over. And so he's saying right here, don't don't go investigating everything, trying to find the issues. You won't have any freedom at all. He says, just mellow out and let the meat be a mystery and enjoy it and have a good dinner. And then he goes on and he says here in verse 27, if any of those who don't believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, Eat whatever's set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. So if a heathen invites you to a barbecue and you want to go, what's he say? He says, go this way. Go as a love reflector, not a meat inspector. Okay? (laughs) That's what you're supposed to do. Don't make it the topic of the dinner conversation. So, where'd you get this meat? Kosher kitchen or demon deli? You know? (laughs) Don't turn the night into a food fight. 
when it's really a faith fight. That's what it's supposed to be about. It's, it's a great opportunity as you go over there, not to talk about food, but to talk about faith, to talk about the freedom that's found in Christ, and to talk about the difference that he could make in a person's life rather than pointing out all of their pagan practices. But look at this, verse 28. It's interesting again. But, he says, if anyone says to you, hey, this was offered to idols, don't eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. And he says, in case we didn't understand it, conscience, I say, not yours, but that of the other guy. For why should my liberty be judged by another guy's conscience? So verse 26, verse 27, you always have to pay close attention with Paul. He repeats the same quote, and he says, you know what? You should eat the meat because, you know, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And then he says, now you shouldn't eat the meat because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And you go, wait a minute. What are you talking about here? Well, look closely again. Verse 28, the start of it says, if someone tells you this, what's going on here? Well, again, as a Christian, you and I don't have to look for problems and try and find them and try and point them out and sniff out the sin, but there's going to be places where the sin doesn't need no sniffing, and it comes and hits you right in the face, and you know what? That's when you get principle number six, which is that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What does this mean? Well, again, in this context, opposing the proud, well, think about it again. You're at the barbecue, and you tell your host, happens to be a heathen, Hey, great cut of meat. This is really good. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Pastor Scott, I stole it. I work at Publix, and man, I stole it. It's awesome. I take it some out every week. As a matter of fact, I got a whole fridge full of stolen food out back. You want some? Well, what am I going to do there? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, maybe that'd be good for our homeless outreach. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. No, you're going to say stolen steak. Sorry, man, I can't do that. And here's why I can't do that. I can't have it here. I can't take it to go. And so, again, you see the difference between the two. There's one in which, yeah, sometimes sin covers, I mean, love covers over a multitude of sin. But you know what? Sometimes love loves enough to confront the sin. And God will make it very clear through these passages when and where to do those things. And so verse 30, he says, If I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of, of the food which I gave thanks? Verse 31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Now, we stop there and I start back with that story and just kind of remind you of it. You know, D.J. Scott, remember that? Well, I lost my privileged position, right? Because I got involved in a food fight. A food fight just took me out of that place of privilege. And now, DJ, all it stood for in my life, detention, janitor. That's it, cleanup crew. Uh, there were no food fights, and if there were, hey, I got to clean up after them. No more spinning the discs and, you know, wax and the, doing the wax and all that. Now I'm waxing the floor. And here's the thing, I want to remind you that we here as a church, you know what? We will lose our privileged position if we get involved in food fights of life. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm not talking about losing salvation. That's not what I mean by the privilege of position there. No, see, this church has a great privilege, and it's an honor, which is that this has been a salvation station. It's just unbelievable what God has done here in such a short time, and just touching so many lives. I mean, I know a lot of you right here in this room came to faith right here in this room and are growing in your faith right here in this room, and this is the whole thing about it. You know what? It's so easy for churches sometimes to get involved in the equivalent of food fights. That's all it is. It's really not the faith fight. Man, it's a food fight. When you really get down to it, it's some non-essential, non-important difference and distinction that, well, I think this, and I'm all my perspective's that, and all that kind of thing. And God says, no, 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 no. See, Jesus said, the world will know you as my disciples, as my followers, because of your great knowledge. No, he didn't say that. Although we should have great knowledge of God's word. He said, they'll know you because of your great love for one another. That will be the distinguishing factor. Not the Knowledge that's puffed you up, but the love that will build up, the love that will overlook an offense. Because you know what? It's a minor matter. If you look at it and say, in, in the light of salvation, almost everything 
is a minor matter, just a little food fight. And so our relationships at home, you know, our families, so much of what goes on, man, it's just a food fight. You look at it and you go, this is just a food fight. Between the parents and the kids and everybody, uh, food fights. You say, wait, we're supposed to be involved in the faith fight. Think about this. Paul, at the end of his life, said, man, I have fought the food fight. No, he said, I have fought the good fight. What was the good fight? The fight of faith, man. He was out there fishing for men and women, people to come to faith and to grow in the knowledge and love of the Lord. And how did they do that? By seeing those things at work in us, by seeing God at work in us. And so if we lack love here as a church, you know what? No amount of knowledge will make up for it in the end. I'm not knocking knowledge. You know, go to college, get some knowledge. That's okay. But sometimes as Christians, I think we know too much and love too little. So they will know us by our love. And so the final point, what is it? Do whatever you do. Did you see it there in those final verses? Do whatever you do for God's glory. Whatever you do, do it for God's glory. A great question to ask. Can I do, can I say, can I be what I'm about to do, say, and be to the glory of God? And see, God gets a lot of glory when we live a humble life of faith and love. But you know what? He gets a bad reputation when we are puffed up in pride because of our knowledge and that we know that somebody's a sinner or not a sinner or this is wrong and this is bad and all that sort of thing and we want to get into those kind of discussions, you know what, at the end of the day, it's a food fight. It's not the faith fight. And so God gets the glory when we live a life of love and when we think of others instead of ourselves. And so that Christian life, it's not really the food fight. It's a faith fight and we need to keep that always before. That it's a battle for souls and we are to be salt and light. We've talked about that in recent studies, you know, but we can't do that if, you know, we're throwing the salt in people's faces and things like, wait, that's not it. That's not what he's talking about. It's a battle for souls and salvation. He says it right there, verse 33. This is what drove Paul's life. Verse 33, that they might be saved. And so God is very glorified when sinners are saved. If you're a Christian here tonight, God got great glory and gets great glory by starting with a sinner and from that making a saint. One who's not only growing in the knowledge of God, but in the likeness of God, in his love. And so God wants and desires that all would be saved. Saved from a life of pride and selfishness. Saved from a life of meaninglessness. You know, just... The pursuit of knowledge, which dies with us anyway, you know? And you think of all the things that God wants to save us from, save from the power of sin and the penalty of sin in our lives. But he also wants to save us for something, save us for fellowship, and save us for bearing fruit in the lives of other people. Yeah, we can be saved from the death we deserve. That's great. But we're saved for the life that he meant us to live. And so few find that even. Some would say, oh, I'm saved, but there's still that something. What is that something so often? It's the very thing that we're talking about here is that it, somehow we got real mixed up in food fights and we've forgotten what it is to really live the faith fight, to really go out and do those things that God has called us to do in that way. So if you want to bring God glory, live a life of love, and it certainly starts in our lives with salvation. So I want to ask and close as we always do here with that call with that question which is are you saved here tonight are you saved here tonight and a lot of times if you ask someone that directly they'll say i think so i'm pretty sure and sometimes list off a, a bunch of reasons like you know well i did this or i never eat fish on friday or or, or things like that and you say or my father was a, my mother was a, my brother is a you know, that type of thing, or I've been a pretty decent person and all those kind of things, and you say, wait a minute. If those are the qualifications, then how could you ever know for sure? Well, you couldn't, because it would always be, have I done enough? Have I been enough? Did I mess up here, and did that disqualify? No, God didn't want us to live that way, and so what he did is he sent his son as the perfect life to make it very clear that that's the standard that God has for a person if they want to make it on their own value, on their own merit, on their own ability, 
Well, only one guy was able to do that, and that's Jesus. But the great thing is that he said, you know what? If you'll put your faith in him, you'll be able to follow him right where he went, which is to heaven, to the very side of of God. And so as you think about that promise, you think about that, that's the kind of security, that's the kind of surety that God wants you to have. And as we're here tonight, I hope in some ways that we've addressed maybe some things that people have a misconception of God, that he really is concerned about the minor matters, you know, that he really cares what kind of food we ate or didn't eat or whether or not it came from here or there or whether it was you know, I washed my hands right before I did it. Well, you know, my mom cares about those things. But my heavenly father really ultimately does not care at all about those things. What he cares about is the cleanliness of my heart. And the only way to have my heart cleaned is to have Christ come inside. And it, let me tell you, if the creator of the universe enters your life, you'll know it. And that's why I say, you know, you need to know. Not, I think, I might, I think. I hope, no, I know. And so you can go away tonight with that assurance because of the promises of the Bible, not because of my word, but because of God's, which says so clearly to us that it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so I come back to that question that the uh, energy drinks ask, which is, is it in you? Well, in Christianity, no, it's, is, in, is he in you? See, God's not going to ask you questions about whether you ate fish on Friday or any of that. He's going to ask you, what did you do with my son? What did you do about the cross? What did you do about the resurrection? Did you put your faith in him? Did you trust in my grace? And so tonight we're just going to close our eyes. We're going to pray. And at the end of that, I'm going to give an opportunity for you to raise your hand if you want to make a commitment to Christ here today. If you want to make a declaration and a decision that, yes, I want that, Lord. I want to pray a prayer to open my heart, open my life, make a commitment unto you. Is the power in the prayer, is the, somehow it's magical words? No, not at all. The, the power is in God to change the life of anyone who would come to him humbly and in faith. So that's the opportunity I give you here tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we spent in your word. And we see that even those things that maybe in first look might not be that applicable to us. And we say, well, I don't understand the Bible. Lord, by your spirit, you make these things understandable and applicable to our lives. And you could change Dade County through just a few people who understood what it is to live this way, to live not just with a knowledge about you, but a love for you and a love for the lost and a desire to make the major things major and the minor things minor. And Lord, to overlook those things that don't matter in eternity but to be very passionate about those things that do. And certainly, Lord, salvation is what you're all about. Again, thank you for making this church a group of believers who believe in you, who love your word, who love you, and who love the lost. And so, God, here tonight, just in that simple way as we do, we want to give an opportunity for anyone here, maybe who came with a friend or came for the first few times and wants to make that decision and declaration sure, simple, and clear and come to you tonight. And so with our heads still bowed, our eyes closed, if there's anyone here in this room who doesn't know for sure that there is a day and a time and a moment where they came to Christ and said, Jesus, I want you in my life as my Lord, as my Savior, and as my friend. Well, tonight can be your night for doing that. All you need to do is raise your hand high so I can see it and give me an opportunity to pray with you tonight to accept Christ. Anybody here tonight, if you were brought by a friend, you know what, that may be the best friend that you have in the world who would bring you to Christ for an opportunity like this, bring you to church for an opportunity like this. It's not joining a church, it's not joining this church, it's joining the family of God. It's making a decision, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. Anybody here tonight who wants to make that decision and declaration. I see you there. Praise the Lord. Anybody else here tonight? Anyone else? Don't want to miss an opportunity if God is calling you here tonight. My mom has a little phrase on her fridge and it says a friend is somebody who knows all about you and loves you anyway. And you know what? That's God. He knows all about you. He knows 
as gross as this is, the contents of your stomach, but you know what's more gross than that? The contents sometimes of our mind and heart. And you know, if all he did was know us well, that would be pretty sad in a way. He could just condemn us, but he loved us. His love as great and greater than his knowledge of us. And so what a friend we have. The Bible says the friend of sinners. So if you're a sinner here tonight and you say, man, I could use that kind of friend, that's what God's all about. All you need to do is raise your hand and accept his offer. I see you here, there. Praise the Lord. Anybody else here tonight? Those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to pray this prayer. The words, let them be from your heart. God sees and knows your heart. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died and he rose again to give me life. He died the death that I deserved so that I might live a life of love. Love for you, love for others. And Lord, thank you for forgiveness and new life. Be my Lord, my friend, my Savior. I want to follow you every day forward from this day. In Jesus' name, amen.